Hello, good morning, and welcome back to our UE4 tutorial series. Couple things to keep in mind. This tutorial is gonna build on the door that we built last time. So if you did not follow that last tutorial, you are probably gonna to wanna to go ahead and check that out. Uh, that will get you in the right place to start this tutorial. Today, we're gonna to be learning about a couple more fundamental programming concepts like variables and references. I actually broke this tutorial into two parts. Uh, part two is gonna be the video after this so that we take things at a little bit of a slower pace. And as always, if you feel like anything I say moves too fast or is too confusing, uh, I'll link some extra resources under this video so that you have some additional places to go and look for more information. All right, what is a variable? In programming, a variable is basically an empty vessel that you can use to store some kind of information. You can think of variables a little bit like this. Imagine a shoebox. It can be empty or it can be full. And when it is full, a shoebox holds one type of thing, shoes, right? In other words, the type of data that a shoebox holds is type shoe. The two most common things we want to do with variables are read from and write to them. When you read from a variable, you're trying to learn something about the current value or the current state of that variable. And when you write to the variable, you're trying to set its state. So again, to use the shoebox metaphor, if we are reading the shoebox variable, that means we want to know the current state of what it contains. It's like opening up the lid of the shoebox and taking a peek inside. If we are writing to the shoebox variable, then that means we want to actually put some shoes inside of it. In other words, by writing to a variable, we can set the current state of that variable. Now, we've already done a little bit of working with classes earlier in this tutorial series. Classes can have variables of their own that come with any instance spawned from that class. So, for example, and this will make more sense soon, a member of the class door could have a variable that is just its locked state and that variable would be a boolean that is set to true or false, which determines whether the door is locked or unlocked. Then, by having added this variable as a member to that class, any door that we spawn in the world is going to have that exact same locked variable that we can check at any time. This also comes in handy when other blueprints or other things in the world want to talk to our door and perhaps set its locked or unlocked state, which is what we'll be doing today. In any video game world, a bunch of objects in the world are secretly talking to each other all the time by passing back and forth information about their current state to one another. In the average video game, your character, for example, probably has some variables that are being set on it constantly, such as how many hit points do you have right now? Uh, what items do you have equipped? Is your character currently alive or dead? When one game object in the world wants to modify another, for example, let's say an enemy hits your character, they modify the variables on your character by grabbing what's called a reference to those variables and then changing the value of those variables. In a nutshell, a reference is basically just an easy way for one game object to get information from another game object so that it can either read from or write to that information on the second game object. So today we're gonna to be building a switch that pairs with the door that you built last time. The switch is pretty simple. When you walk over it, it will set the value of your door to true or false, which will then change some information on your door. And this allows your character to walk through the door. Anyway, enough talking, let's get started. And I think you'll see what I mean once we actually start building something. Okay, so to get started, let's go ahead and open up our map that we've been working in. Uh, if you have been doing the homework assignments and you have built yourself a lovely maze, uh, that's totally fine. Just go ahead and pick any door to kind of use the starting reference here. Uh, for the purposes of this tutorial, they will all work equally well. The switch that we're going to be building today is just a typical press switch, like you've probably seen in a bunch of platforming type video games before. So to get started, uh, let's go ahead and pick a sound effect online that you want to play when you step on your switch. Um, I went ahead and took the liberty of downloading some random sound effect called click to Sebastian something something. Um, it's a mess, but I'm going to go ahead and drag it in. I, I will link to this sound effect if you would like to get the exact same sound effect, but really any free kind of click or press type sound will do. Um, and once we have that dragged into our project, I'm going to go ahead and like give that a more realistic name, like switch press. So it's not named some horrible random online name. The next thing we're going to do is of course, create our switch blueprint. So right click here, uh, and again, we wanna create a blueprint class just like we did with our door. That is gonna be of type actor, once again, nice and vanilla. And I'm just gonna call that switch and save that project. Now, before we actually do anything with the switch, let's go ahead and make sure that our door is set up properly to be locked and unlocked. So we'll open up that door blueprint um, and it should look just like this unless you've made some extra changes to it. Uh, and what we're gonna wanna do is create 
a member variable on our class that just states whether the door is currently locked or unlocked. So in order to add a variable to any class in UE4, you actually want to go over here and down under the My Blueprint section, you will find this little variables header. And this is, uh, it's got this little plus button right over here. You want to press that and it will create a new variable. Um, it will usually just create the variable of type whatever you last made a variable. I, I think in my case, I was practicing before I filmed this video, so it was a Boolean. Um, if your variable type is not red, if it's something else, don't worry about it. We're going to change it in a second. Go ahead and give that variable a name like uh, is door locked, which is very self-explanatory. I love it. Um, and then uh, we're going to go right up here on the right. And you should see over here in the details, the variable name, which we just set. You could also set it here if you would rather not name it there or you misclicked and now the variables named something dumb. You can change that name here. Um, the variable type is the type of data that this variable holds. In this case, uh, we would like for that to be a Boolean. A Boolean is a type of data that is set to true or false. Uh, and that's all we care about. Is the door locked or unlocked? We don't need anything fancier here. So go ahead and click that drop down. You should see a bunch of really common variable types here. Um, set that to Boolean. I'm just going to give you a super quick rundown of what all of these types are in case you would like to be building more things in the future. A Boolean is a type of variable that's set to true or false. That's all. A byte is an 8-bit number. Uh, this is a little bit of a fancy one. You are probably not going to use bytes until you are making what's called an enum. Uh, we will work on that in later tutorials. For now, don't stress about bytes. Uh, you don't need to know them. They're not fundamental data. Uh, an integer, again, this is a really, really common one that we use across nearly all programming languages. An integer is just a type of variable that holds numbers with no floating decimal point on the end. So if your number is like a whole number and you know for sure you don't want any weird decimal business going on with it, like if you're trying to perform math functions and you always want it to come out as a clean one, two, three, four, uh, you would use an integer for that kind of equation. Um, on the other hand, and I'm going to skip in 64 since this is just a weird advanced version of an integer. If you wanted to be performing any kind of mathematical equation on a number variable that did have a floating decimal point, then you would use a float. So as you can see, when we were building our door before, um, we were using a float to do that equation because uh, as the door is translating through a bunch of its height, it is moving. It's If you were to use an integer, you would see it like jump to clean single number uh, like variables along its movement process. And we want that to be totally smooth. We want that calculation to be nice and even. So we're going to use a float just so like it always is mathing out to like a very clean, nice linear curve. Um, a name variable uh, in UE4, this is basically just a type of text operation. We will be going into the differences between names, strings, and text in the future uh, when we do some of our UI focus tutorials. So don't stress about this right now. Mostly what we want to be using um, these are, at this point, for the most part, interchangeable for you. Uh, we will talk about the nuances of them later. A vector refers to a 3D position in the world. Uh, a vector can either be a point or it can be a line, depending on how you are using it. Very confusing, I know. Uh, if you took calculus, this will totally make sense to you. If you have never taken calculus, then it won't. But I think uh, you will probably learn by doing once we start to manipulate some vectors in the future. A rotator is some information about the rotational degree that a game object is currently rotated to. So this is really helpful if you're trying to make things that spin or rotate on their axis and you want to like manipulate that rotation. Like some games have a UI where you can like turn objects around like those hidden object adventure type games in 3D and you can like look at the object from all sides. You would be using rotators to perform that kind of equation pretty often. Uh, and then lastly, a transform variable is just a, a it's it's information about uh, this object's trans current vector and its current rotation packaged down into one. So transform is actually a very complex variable that is um, specific to game engines. And it just contains a bunch of like information that you would want to know about that object's 3D state all crunched down. So transforms are really helpful. We'll get into them later. But they're also an advanced type of variable that you may not see in other programming languages. They're kind of specific to game engines. 
The really nice thing about variables in UE4 is that UE4 does attempt to color code them for us so that we don't do anything dumb uh, trying to manipulate data in a way that UE4 doesn't like us to be manipulating it uh, or trying to use a variable for a type of thing that it can't actually be used for. So now that we have created our Boolean, um, we want to set this Boolean to be public so that other game objects can read the state of this variable. So here's something that's important about variables that other objects are trying to reference. Uh, a variable can have a variety of what we call privacy states or protection states on it um, to determine whether or not other objects can actually see and manipulate that variable's data. So some programming languages, uh, for example, have uh, the ability for you to like determine whether a variable is readable and writable, just readable, um, or not even readable or writable at all, in which case it's private. Uh, these states are usually known as public for can read and write, protected for can be read sometimes, and private, cannot read, cannot write. Why would we want to do this? Well, uh, sometimes you want to build content in such a way that you know for a fact certain variables should never be getting touched by any other game object anywhere. However, when you are working on a large game project, you may have some idiot designer like Katie Tironis over here who does not know which variables are not supposed to be getting set and getted and may start trying to mess with those variables when she is working on a given object. And so what you can do as the engineer is lock down those variables so that nobody else can be accessed reading or writing them, which might actually mess up that game object in some permanent way. Uh, and it's, it's just a really nice and clean way to generally write code. So often private variables are very useful when you're building more advanced projects. Today, we want this one to be public so that other game objects can read to and write to uh, this door locked variable. So in order to do that, privacy in UE4 is determined by, you see this little semicircle over here? Um, it's actually a closed eye. You would never find that on your own. Don't worry about it. It's This is dumb. Um, I don't know why it's this hard to find. But the way that you can set whether a variable is public or private is by clicking the eye. If the eye is open, it doesn't even look like an eye, whatever. Um, it's, it's public if the eye is open. It's private if the eye is closed. In this case, we would like it to be public. So make sure that that eye is open. So now what we need to do is add a little bit of logic to this door that basically says, I am not going to open if I'm locked right now. Uh, and I am going to open if I'm unlocked. So in order to do that, we're going to add what is called a branch node. Branch nodes are really common in UE4, and they basically just check a Boolean and say, if the Boolean is true, do X. If the Boolean is false, do Y. Uh, so let's drag off from our pin here. And uh, we are going to type in branch, and that should pull up this node right here. So as you can see, when you hover over it, it's got this little handy dandy white box here that says, if condition is true, execution goes to true, otherwise it goes to false, great. Uh, we are now going to use the variable that we just made in practice. So go ahead and click and drag on that variable. And we are, this is where you would either be able to set your variable if you were trying to change the value of that variable, or you can get the variable if you would like to use the variable and read from its current state. In this case, we want to read from that variable because we are checking, hey, at the time that the player runs into this player trigger and we determine that they are actually a player, in other words, we would like to try and open the door. Is the door locked or is it unlocked? If it is locked, then do nothing. If it is unlocked, then open the door. So is door locked? If is door locked is true, then the door is locked. So we should do nothing. Right click on this and hit break. And this is how you can actually break. Uh, if you ever like connect a white node and you want to unhook it, you can right click on this little arrow and hit break link and that will snap it off. Uh, so if the door is locked, then we would like to do nothing. Great, this is empty. If the door is not locked, if it's false, then that means that we can open the door. So let's go ahead and open that door. So now if we hit save, and we go out, we never change, this is door locked variable starts false. So the door will be always unlocked by default, but let's go ahead and set the default starting value of that door to be locked. In other words, now all doors in our world will start locked by default because we have set the default value of this variable to be true. Now we also need to do the exact same thing on this close function as well, if we want this to work appropriately. So let's go ahead and do the exact same thing. We want to just 
branch it and check is door locked. Um, if the door is locked, then we want to do nothing. If it's not locked, then we want to be able to close it back up. Um, so that will come in handy later. And now, uh, if you decide to hit play and go out to your game world, sure enough, because the door starts locked, you should see it do absolutely nothing when you walk up to it now. It is locked by default and we are actually never setting it to be unlocked. So currently it can never be opened. The next thing we are gonna do before we actually go and set up our switch is we are going to create a variable uh, that is a string of text that sits on the front of our door that changes to say locked or unlocked depending on whether the door is currently locked or unlocked so that we can just tell that visually without walking up to it. Um, so go ahead and click on your viewport up here to look at your door. And we're gonna go ahead and up here on the left, uh, just like we have done before, click add component. And we would like to add a text render. Renders text in the world with given font. Contains usual font related attributes such as scale, alignment, color, etc. I love it. Let's call this locked text. Uh, so you will see that this little text thing spawned here. Um, it's kind of stuck halfway through the door, so it's kind of hard to see, but it is just a giant like floating set of text. So let's go ahead and uh, put that above the door. We are going to rotate it uh, 90 degrees. I said 90, thank you. And <laughs> we're gonna move that, um, it's already centered it looks like. We're gonna change the alignment of that text. So over here under the text properties, you can actually change some of the values of it. Um, let's go ahead and make it center aligned. Uh, you can also change vertical alignment and we could change the color. This is sweet. I'm gonna make it like blue because why not? You can change it to be whatever color you'd like. So we are gonna try and update that text every frame of the game and just have it update to whatever the door's current state is. So the way that we can do that, you see this event tick box over here, it's kind of like shadowy um, and grayed out. This tick function is a function that gets called on every blueprint in the game, every frame of the game. Um, so if you were building a giant game, like an open world game, um, you would never ever use this function. Your engineers would hate you and your life would suck uh, because performance would be terrible. But guess what? We're just building for funsies, so we don't care about that. Um, this event tick is gonna get called constantly. So this is great for when you wanna like update the visibility or the status of any, everything and you want it to be like super quick and responsive, use tick for that kind of thing. What we are going to do is again, pull this off, type in branch and you can see now this event turns on because now this event actually is gonna be used. So it's gonna be called. Uh, we are going to grab that is store locked variable again we are going to drag off a reference to this text and then we are, if the door is locked, we are just going to drag off here, type in set text uh, and we are just going to set the value of that text to be whatever we would like in the case that it's locked. So I, now what we're going to do is make a literal variable, which basically means we are creating a hard coded value for that variable. So drag off here and type in make, which means that we're just going to make a hard coded value. And we would like that text to say locked. I mean, you could technically make it say whatever you like. I'm going to make it say locked. Um, your choice, dealer's choice. Uh, in the case that the door is not locked, on the other hand, let's go ahead and drag that off. And we will change that text to say unlocked, which is super obvious and very clear. So now when we actually go ahead and hit play, we should see Aha, the door says locked. And guess what? Never says unlocked because we haven't set up anything to unlock it yet. So that's okay. Let's go ahead and make our switch now. All right, let's back out and let's go into our switch. And we are going to recreate a pattern that should look pretty familiar because it's essentially the same thing that we did to make the door. We are going to uh, add a little button mesh that is what you actually see in the world. And then we're gonna add a trigger volume that detects when the player moves into it and decides to press the switch. So let's go ahead and start by, I mean, you can make your switch look like anything. I'm gonna sil I'm gonna make it a cylinder because I think that gives it the nice round like buttony look. So I'm gonna squash one of those down. And I'm actually like gonna even put one below it. Like I love that like 
really big Mario Party style button. So I'm actually gonna make a second cylinder and like scale it up and you'll see what I'm doing here in, in a second. Um, I'm gonna make that material like a, a darker color. Ooh, yeah, like that wood. And then this top button, I'm gonna make it like, I'm gonna make it purple, just like the door. It'll match the door. So when we look at our switch, this is this is like what our switch looks like. I actually want it to be like more big and buttony. Yeah, like that. It's a chonky switch. I love it. Great. Okay, so then we've got our little cylinders here. Now let's go ahead and add our box collision, just like we did with the door. Uh, I'll call this switch collider just to make it super clear what's going on here. Um, this is a cube. Do we, you know, hey, the switch is a circle, you might ask. Do we want to use a circular collision volume? Um, the answer is you can. I, I am in the habit of using boxes for everything because spheres are really expensive when you're making a big video game. So often engineers would prefer that you use things with, with fewer faces on them, which is less calculation cost. It's just cheaper. Um, but you can also make this, make this a sphere collider if you would like perfect accuracy on your switch. Um, but I think for now, this is fine. I'm gonna go ahead and compile this and save that out. So now we want to bind to the overlap event of that collider, just like we did with the door again. So go ahead and down on the right here on component begin overlap. I love it. We are just gonna toggle that switch or that door on and off. Uh, so on component begin overlap. Well, when we overlap with the switch, we would like to set the corresponding door to be locked or unlocked. We would like to flip the Boolean. So um, what we are gonna do is get a reference to the door that we are paired with as the switch, and then we are gonna set its variable. So let's go ahead and add a new local variable that will store the value of that reference. And that variable is gonna be of type door. So let's go ahead and name that my door. As you can see, it's a Boolean because that's the last type of variable that we made. We're gonna go up here and we're gonna change it. And we are gonna change it to type door. That's right, classes can also be variable types. Very handy thing in UE4. So now we know that this type of variable is of type door, which actually lets us use all of the door related class functions whenever we try to use this variable. So this is really exciting because it means that we can do things like get my door and uh, set locked. Let's see if we type in locked, we should, aha, all the way down here, we can actually set whether that door is locked or unlocked. I love it. So. Let's just try making that a, a one-way thing. Um, let's just for now have it that when we overlap with that collider, we're just gonna set that door locked to be false. Okay, but there's a problem here, which you're gonna see in a second. So let's go ahead and uh, let's let's put one of our switches into the world right here. Let's let's like put it right, right here. I'm gonna make it like super big so it's really obvious that we walked over it. Um, for sure. And what we're trying to do is just set that door to be unlocked, right? But, oh wait, it's not unlocking. Because even though we created a member variable on the switch that could hold a reference to a door, guess what? UE4 is even throwing some errors here. It's saying access none, trying to read property my door. In other words, hey dummy, you have this variable but that would store a reference, but she didn't actually do the getting the reference part. This variable is empty right now. It doesn't have anything that I can do. So I'm not 100% sure where I'm supposed to set this locked variable. Uh, thanks UE4, love the warning. So what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna make this my door variable public and we are going to set the default value of that switch out in the world. So let's go out into the instance. We're gonna set it on the instance rather than on the class. So uh, this is useful when you want to pair specific instances of things in the world with each other. Um, and we'll look at more advanced ways of doing references in our next tutorial, but this is like a really basic one that you can use um, if you're trying to keep it simple. So in this case, uh, let's let's take the switch and we are going to, now you see down here, because you made that variable public, it actually shows up right here. Like if you were to go to your switch and make it private again and compile and then go back out, oh, it's empty, it's not here anymore. But let's go ahead, make that public, compile, and oh, there it is, pops back out again. 
So default, my door. Um, sure, let's pair it with the only door in our map. Now they're paired to each other. Great. Uh, if you were going to build a map that had a bunch of doors and switches in it, you would probably want to name these more obvious names that correspond with each other, such as switch purple and door purple, so that you know that the purple switch goes with the purple door. But for now, we only have one, so we're not going to stress about it. So now, if we save and we hit play, let's see some magic happen. It's locked. We're going on. Oh, it's unlocked. And now we can go through the door. Oh, I love it. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, so we're going to do two very slightly fancier things. Uh, we are going to try and create a second door and a second switch. So let's go ahead and copy paste this door. You could also just like drag another door into the scene if you wanted to, but we had done some scaling on this door. So I like having it at that scale. Ditto with the switch, copy and paste. Um, so now you will see that this switch still has a reference to that first door. So uh, you would probably want to make it reference door two, the second door, um, just so it is not like, like this switch is currently linked to the, the door that the switch was copied from. So um, it's just referencing that first door. So now they each reference their own door. So I can actually like have this switch unlock this door, doesn't unlock that one because they're not paired together. This switch only has a reference to that door. On the other hand, if I go press this switch, it unlocks the right door. And the very last thing we're going to do, sure enough, is play a little bit of feedback to the player when we go over the switch. I always find that it's really nice to give the player some feedback. For example, um, you might want to put the switch around a corner from the door and not within sight of the door. So the player has no way to know, hey, a door just unlocked somewhere. Um, they just walk over the switch and nothing appears to happen. I think it's good to give a little bit of feedback to them. So what we're going to do is we're going to play a sound when the player walks over this, this switch. So let's go ahead and drag off and play sound at location. And let's go ahead and pick that sound. Oh my gosh, what do we call that sound? I can't remember. Switch press. That's what it was called. Switch press. I love it. Uh, and we also have to give it a location in the world. By default, it will play at 000, which could be in the middle of nowhere. Actually, I actually don't know where that is. Uh, so we would like to right click here, type in get world location. Um, we could actually even, I mean, like get the default scene roots location and just, oh wait, no, it doesn't like that because the scene root is ambiguous. Let's get the cylinders location of the actual switch. Uh, and we will plug that in to give it a place to play that sound. By the way, if you ever want to check whether a sound is actually working in Unreal, you can go ahead and just click on the sound and hit space. And I hear a little click, so it's working. Um, you can also click that little play button triangle on it. Uh, if you are trying to work with sounds and you're downloading free sounds online, every now and then you just get a dud or a sound that doesn't work. So if you're not hearing anything when you step on your switch, it might just be that you picked a bad sound. But now when we play that switch sound, it should be amazing. Let's see if I hear it. I'm gonna, yep. I don't have it on my video audio, but you can hear a little click anytime you run over that switch. And that's a nice bit of extra feedback to the player to let them know that something somewhere changed. So that's a wrap on today's lesson that covers a lot of the basics of getting and setting variables on your classes, as well as storing and using references to other blueprints. Your homework assignment, if you choose to accept it, is to take whatever you're doing with these doors, maybe you built a maze, maze maybe you haven't done anything with them yet, and take the switch that we built today and try to pair switches with doors to create some kind of basic puzzly type maze game where the player has to figure out how to open a series of doors to win. In our next lesson, we will be taking a look at some more advanced techniques and tactics for doing this kind of thing, especially when you have many different game objects to control in your world, uh, and we'll be building some cool elevators while we're at it. So until then, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave those in the comments below and I will get to them. And otherwise, as always, have a great week and see you next time. And I just got me some sauce, feel like goo wow. And I've been down, I've been frowned, for two, uh -huh. So why the hell I should smile, see by fuck that So why the hell I should smile, see